So tonight's reading starts um, Isaiah 52, verse 13. Do you open along? See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a slam, a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes life, makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening, guys. And uh, if I have not yet met you, uh, my name is Jody, and it's great to be here with you this evening. If you were to learn one thing about me tonight, it is that I am an overthinker, like chronically an overthinker. You know, if you have an important meeting and you know that you're going into it, you bet I have spent so much time in my head thinking every single possibility that could come up in this conversation. Like, everything has been covered by me. And sometimes I go down rabbit holes uh, that are kind of totally unproductive and pretty useless. For example, when I was preparing for this talk, spending some time reading and praying and doing whatever else, I was also spending quite a significant amount of time staring at a blank wall, trying to logically figure out how many people on earth were called Jody. Um, my best guess after 20 minutes is 90,000. Uh, come and ask me how I got to that number after. But um, the other day, I texted a friend saying, I've picked you up a coffee I know, I'm, I'm nice. And um, she texts back with one word, and that one word was butte. Butte. What does that mean? And as I walked with this coffee in hand to go and deliver it to her, my mind went into one of those overthinking modes, and I got all kind of meta and was like, what is beauty? Like, what, what is beauty? And um, it's pretty handy, because actually then I was asked to speak on that today. The beauty of the cross. And whilst I was walking, it kind of got me thinking, like, we are obsessed with beauty. We have countless TV shows like Love Island and Married at First Sight, all based around this kind of modern Western perception of beauty. We've got beauty influencers and TikTokers and influencers, celebrities. We've got beauty regimes. And in 2022, the UK beauty market was worth 39 billion pounds. We're obsessed with beauty. 
But it seems as though we're also pretty confused by beauty. It seems that no one really ever agrees with what is beautiful. So I did what any super holy Christian would do, and I Googled it. And it turns out, when you type in to Google, uh, what is beauty, it comes up with kind of people, and uh, it turns out that the most beautiful, scientifically the most beautiful person at the moment is an actor called Roger Jean Page. We got some fans? I mean, this is according to science. Like, who am I to argue? Using a metric, you can take it down because they won't listen to me if he's still up there. <laughs> according to a metric uh, called the Greek Golden Ratio, a world-renowned facial plastic surgeon took all of the people that he could get his hands on a picture of and figured out who the most beautiful is, looking at things like the symmetry of his forehead. And, um, you know, I, I can agree, like, he's a beautiful man and he has a very symmetrical forehead. But maybe not everyone in here would agree that he is the most beautiful person you have ever seen. Like, is this true beauty? Unsatisfied by my research on Google, I decided I'd ask a bunch of my friends on Instagram. Some of their responses uh, can be seen here. We've got lots of great pictures and sunsets and beautiful places. We've got my brother's dog, Cooper. He's a, he's a good-looking dog. And then we had some more. These were some of my favorites. <laughs> we have Stephen, <laughs> Stephen Gerrard's 30-yard screamer in the 2006 FA World uh, F Cup final in West Ham. Can agree. It was beautiful. And obviously, the Lioness is winning. Come on. Beautiful, beautiful. We had a few more, which are my favorite. Uh, <laughs> Jodie Linton, that's me, by the way. Uh, and my friend, one of my good friends, I think, meant this It was like the most sunburnt I've ever been. But I decided to put it up there because my triceps look good. And so uh, I'd agree, beautiful. And then some others. We've got, what have we got going on here? Yeah, we've got the food. These are the foodies. These are the ones without friends or lives. Um, the steak platter at the Chester Arms is of worthy note. Give that a go if you haven't yet so far. Some more. These are the ones with family and friends. I think childbirth. Thankfully, they saved the pictures. Um, but some, some beautiful... I don't have much experience of childbirth. Um, but it seems messy and painful. Not beautiful, but uh, I'm sure you can tell me why. Some others, we've got uh, <laughs> some other fun ones. And finally, the holy people showed up, and we've got some holy responses. Rooms full of worship and uh, Christians giving their lives to God and, and lots of great things. So lots of, of beautiful moments. And for me, I resonate with the guys in the first slide who love a good view. I've been privileged to live in some of the most beautiful places and spend some time living in New Zealand and would climb mountains and surf on amazing beaches. Have we got any Kiwis in the room? Not tonight, not tonight. <sighs> well, just as, just as well, I'm sure. They're, you know, they're in the most beautiful place, so uh, why would they be here? And um, one time I was with a friend and we were climbing a mountain and we decided that we wanted to do it overnight so that we could see the sunrise in the morning. And we've been climbing for hours, and uh, we finally got up there just in time. Like, the sun had just started to rise, and we stood there. Uh, I, made, I got my jet boil out, and I made myself a coffee. And, and it was this kind of 360 panoramic view of uh, just rolling hills and beautiful mountains. And the clouds started to part, and the sun was rising. We could see whales in the horizon. Not whales as in, like, England, Wales, Scotland, but whales as in the, the animals. And uh, it was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. Like, ever, hands down. And I turned to my friend thinking, like, this is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the most beautiful thing ever. Thinking that he would think the same, but instead, I don't know whether it was the heavy night he had had uh, the prior night, or whether it was altitude or his fitness, but he was, like, hunched over, being sick on his shoes. And... Um, his perception of the most beautiful thing that I had ever witnessed was somewhat tainted. Like, he wouldn't say that that is the most beautiful thing he's ever experienced, and neither would his walking boots. But there's confusion, right, as to what is beauty. We have seen that there are so many different answers. And the concept that each individual has a different definition of what is beautiful and what isn't 
first appeared way pre-Jesus. According to Plato, the sense of beauty is itself transient in nature. So something that is beautiful for one might not be so beautiful for another. And philosophers throughout the time kind of continued to grapple with the question of whether beauty was objective or subjective for centuries. But it was in the 19th century that an author called Mar Margaret Wolf Hungerford formalized the axiom, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We've all heard that, right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Thus to say, beauty is subjective and open to multiple meanings and a variety of interpretations. And we're obsessed with it, because rightly so. Like, there is something captivating and incredible about the beautiful things in life. And we're confused by it, again, rightly so, because there's something, some sense of mystery and unintelligibility as to what beauty is. But for all of the obsession over the imitations of beauty, and for all of the confusion over the facades of beauty, what we learn from today's passage is that somehow we are saved by it. But what do I mean by that? Well, today's talk is all about the beauty of the cross, right? But did you notice that not one person on my Instagram said that Jesus or the cross was the most beautiful thing? And I was kind of surprised because we had over 100 responses and lots and lots of much holier people than I, but not one. Not one person said it. And fine, like, okay, well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so you do you, you decide what is beautiful. But also, I began to realize that they're kind of right. In our today's passage, we find ourselves in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is one of the big guns in the Bible, if you've not read it. He was a prophet over 700 years uh, before Jesus. But in this section of the book, we read a vision that he had, a kind of poem or a song referred to as the Song of the Suffering Servant. In this passage, we read a servant suffering at the hands of people. We see him taking up pain, bearing our suffering, being pierced, crushed, and punished. We read of a priestly figure pouring out his life, an offering for sin. A suffering servant killed at the handling of humankind. Sounds kind of familiar, right? The church has long believed that even though this was 700 years pre-Jesus, this is a prophecy about Jesus and what we taught, uh, teach about and think about and celebrate around Easter. And I was going to read a couple of verses from it again. So Isaiah 53, 4 to 7. Surely he took, upon, took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. After I read this and when I spent some time thinking about Jesus on the cross, I saw no beauty. And I sometimes think it's easier to define things by what it's not. And I can confirm, I do not think the cross in and of itself, this torture weapon, this horrendous death, is beautiful at all. Like, it's brutal. And I often find the fact that Christians use the cross as their symbol pretty perplexing. Christianity had an opportunity to prioritize a symbol that would represent all that it stood for. It could have prioritized a pulpit to represent Jesus' teaching ministry, or perhaps a towel to represent Jesus' servitude, or maybe a table to represent a great heavenly host. But it chose the cross, the cross as the center of everything. The very thing that Jesus died on would become the symbol for an entire faith. It's so mad. The cross was the height of pain and the depth of shame. It wasn't beautiful. And so if the cross isn't beautiful, and maybe it was the person on it that was beautiful. Well, maybe, yeah, like we're just saying, Jesus, you're beautiful, but not in the way that we might think about it, at least. In verse 2 that we read, he says, he grew up, this is Jesus, and he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. 
nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Like savage, right? <laughs> like, you know this is the creator of the universe and you're like, he's ugly. <laughs> if I were God, and I know that is a dangerous line and you will all be thankful that I'm not, but if I did happen to be God, reigning over all of the universe and I knew what I had to go through on earth, I would at least have made sure that I came here the fittest person to have ever walked the earth, like the most beautiful. And all throughout the Bible, we see influential figures who save the day and bring people into freedom attached with physical beauty. For example, in Exodus 2, we see that Moses was beautiful. In Genesis 39, we're told that Joseph was of beautiful appearance. In 1 Samuel 16, we're told that David is a well-formed man of fair countenance. Esther, the woman who would go on to be the queen of Persia and deliver the Jewish people, was beautiful in form and of good appearance. And all throughout the, uh, the Bible, beauty begets power. Beauty leads to power. Beauty is linked with power. But with Jesus we learn that there was probably nothing special about his physicality. Nowhere in the Gospels do we have mention of anything about what Jesus looks like in terms of stature or facial features or hair, his height or physical characteristics. And the likely reason is that in every way, physically, he was pretty average and there was nothing distinctive about his appearance that made worthy of comment. So what I'm saying is Jesus probably wouldn't have made it onto Love Island. <laughs> Jesus is an atypical king. His kingdom is not of this world. The ways in which he ruled, his judgments are not of this world. And even his physical appearance didn't seem to fit the worldly demands of a kingly Messiah. As the new Moses or the new David, Jesus didn't fit the part. And it got worse because upon the cross, we read in today's verse that something horrendous happened. In verse 14, it says, there were many appalled at him, appalled at his appearance. His appearance was so disfigured beyond any human being, and his form was marred by human likeness. Jesus was beaten so badly that he was unrecognizable as a human. And if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, then I think most of us would say, probably not that beautiful. The blood and suffering that Jesus experienced were not beautiful. His death on the cross demonstrates the ugliness of all of humankind's sin, not beauty. The world says that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But actually, I think that true beauty is found in the eyes of the one who we behold. The one we behold on the cross. The eyes that whilst hanging there on the cross looked you in the eyes and said, you are forgiven. You are loved. You are chosen. The eyes that before all of creation saw the man and the woman you would go on to become. The eyes that saw every single thing you would go on to achieve and fulfill in your life. Before all of creation, he saw he sees. It's in those eyes that beauty is found. Beauty is found in those eyes. The cross is only beautiful because of Jesus on the cross, his character, his compassion, his kindness, and his accomplishments upon the cross. But what did he accomplish? Well, the most decisive moment of all of history happened in verse 5. It says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. And perhaps you're sat there thinking tonight, like, what's all this chat of transgression and iniquity? And maybe you're here and you're kind of acutely aware of your sin and your need for a savior. But maybe you're sat here thinking, I'm a pretty decent human being. Like, I was that person. I had done some pretty awful things, but I would have still said I was an all right person. And for all of the chat of sin, iniquity, and whatever else, I was confused. But 
But in verse 6, we find a really handy definition of sin. It says this, each of us has turned to our own way. And this, if I'm honest, I could relate to. Like, I'm a strong, independent woman. I didn't need no savior. Sin is turning away from God and saying, actually, like, my way of living is better. Sin is falling short of this incredible standard of Jesus, like God himself, perfect, the true form of beauty. And it's somewhat unattainable, and so in essence, you can relax, because all of us in here have sinned. And there's repercussions of that separation, of that turning away. There's separation, there's pain, there's death. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story, but, and this is where the beauty is, because As we go right back to the start of the passage read tonight in Isaiah 52, it says in verse 13, he will be raised up and highly exalted. In other words, death is not the end. We know the story of Easter, whether we've grown up around the church or not at all. But a few days later, Jesus literally rises from the dead. Christ, the form of beauty, defeated the cross and defeated its ugliness. He crossed the divide to be with us and completed his demonstration of love in dying for us. Looking backwards to the cross, we can see the power of beauty to overcome even death. Two events, one thing, Jesus died for our sins and rose again to triumph over death and to give us the gift of life in its fullness here on earth right now and also life everlasting. What an accomplishment, what a beautiful thing. And if you're here tonight, and again, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, you're still like, I don't really get this, I don't need it, honestly, I'm a good human, I even give to charity. Like, that's the thing about the gospel. The good news of Jesus isn't that sin makes you bad, sin makes us spiritually dead. Like, dead in the sense that I believe that there is life in its fullness and life eternal, but it's found in God. And if we're separated from that source, like a large branch cut from a tree, this branch might be alive for a while. It might even look like it's living in its fullness, but it's not where it's meant to be. And if spent enough time away from that source of life, it will stop living. And that's the problem, because the branch can't put itself back on the tree. Dead things and dead people can't actually do anything to help themselves. So if there's any notion of like, I will do better, like, I'm just going to do more, I'll make myself a better person, invest in some amazing self-help books. Like, that's not how it works. We can't earn this. No amount of our self-help will bring us into eternal life. Without Christ, we're not bad, we're dead. Jesus didn't live his throne in earth to make bad people good. He, made, he came to do what only he could do and to bring dead people back to everlasting life again. That is the beauty of the cross. It's the power of the resurrection. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, makes us alive. And of course, we want to live good lives that reflect all of that. But that's not the work of the cross. He makes us come alive. By his grace, we have been saved. We're justified. We're made holy. We are brought into this family. And the story is, that if you want to be truly alive, if anything in your heart says, like, I want to experience this, I want to experience life in its fullness, I want to know that I've got life eternal, I can take you to where it happens. It's at the devastatingly beautiful cross of Jesus Christ. And the likelihood is that there are people in here tonight that feel that. Come to the cross today. I still remember my first Easter as a Christian. I was 21, I was living in New Zealand, and um, I went to visit some friends in Australia, and I'd been a Christian for about seven months, I hadn't grown up around the church at all, and um, I went to church in the back of an invitation from a friend and encountered God in a really profound way, and then spent about eight months trying to figure out how to do it, and then Easter came around, and um, I didn't know much about the cross, I probably wouldn't have said that I was kind of... Uh, aware of my sin or my brokenness, but I knew enough that Easter was pretty important for Christians, so I should probably go. And so um, on Good Friday, I went along to church, and Good Friday is traditionally the day where we kind of talk about and remember Jesus' death. 
and we were in this huge church. I'm talking like a couple of thousands of people. And um, across the backdrop here, there was this huge piece of artwork. And this artwork was a painting of Jesus' face. And I can't really remember loads of features of the painting. But what I do remember looking at is his eyes. I was captivated by his eyes. They were piercing and they almost followed me. You know, like even if you try and move out the way, you can still see his eyes on you, but also every other person in the room. And just above his eyebrow, there was a bead of sweat and a single bead of blood. It was utterly beautiful. But eventually, I felt so uncomfortable, and I couldn't look at them, and so I turned away, and I kind of looked at the floor, and I hadn't had much experience of prayer or or listening to God, but in that moment, I had this profound sense that this is what it was like to be at the cross on Calvary, the day that Jesus died. And I could imagine him there, this horrible cocktail of devastation and pain and anguish and hurt and separation in his eyes and yet pure love the kind of love the look in an eye of a parent who is seeing their child for the first time or the kind of look from a friend who is so proud of all that you've achieved or a look from a lover that in a glance you know that they would do absolutely anything for you And as I kind of had my eyes to the ground and closed my eyes, um, I could almost imagine Jesus stood in front of me and he took my face between his hands and just lifted my eyes to fix on his eyes and just held them there. And at that moment, I saw it. I got it. I saw me. I saw Christ. I saw what he did for me. I saw what he died for me. I saw what he paid for me, what he exchanged for me, what he bled for me, what he gave for me. In that moment, everything was different. My whole life was changed and I've never been the same again. Like I found freedom from addiction. I found family. I found purpose and meaning and I found peace amongst some of the hardest storms of life. This is beauty. That whilst we were still sinners, with his gaze set upon you, Christ died for you. The Son of God loves me and gave himself for me. Beauty isn't in the eyes of the beholder. Beauty is found in the eyes of the one we behold. Behold him. Look to him. Don't avert your gaze. If you have, bring it back. Let him hold your face in his hands. Don't rush from his presence. Set your sights on the one who set his sights on you long ago. In Jesus' name, amen.